This is Mark Feldman, Super Training Gym. Super Training Gym, the strongest gym in the West. And today I have two wonderful jacked people to describe how to squat. They went over some stuff on how to bench press. I think she has 20 something all time world records, right? 22. 22? Yeah. Oh right. my God. 22 all time world records. He doesn't have any. But he's got some decent information and every, the good once, looks. <laughs> every once in a while, too. It doesn't really make him a worse person, you know? Steph Cohen, doesn't, doesn't Hayden make Bell, these guys got the hybrid method going. They have thousands upon thousands of people following the hybrid method with great success. So they're going to take some people here at Super Training Gym and show them how to squat. Some, a really commonly asked question is, should you be wearing a flat to squat in or a lifting shoe like Steph has here? Um, and the answer is like most things, it depends. So we do something called the heel test. Uh, and what you do, this is something you can do at home. Uh, if you have a mirror or if you have a, an iPhone or whatever type of phone, and you can film yourself and watch your squat back. Basically what we're trying to do, you wanna set up so you can see your side profile. You're gonna squat down. And you're gonna try to keep your lower back neutral and reach parallel. So what we're looking for uh, in this part of the, the test is if you can't make it to parallel without this happening, you consider that a fail. Not that uh, a fail is necessarily a bad thing. We've said fail before in the past and people got very upset at us for that. So uh, fail is not bad and pass is if not necessarily test, good. Try uh, we're just using it to sort of evaluate the test. Um, if you do uh, uh, fail the first part of the test, we're gonna go ahead and put um, something like a platform underneath your heels. Have Steph do this. Steph. Sure. So let's pretend she failed the first part. I can fail. What do you need, what do you need to do? <laughs> I'll show you some failure. What do I have to do? I have to go squat. So a failure is if you can't make it down to parallel without getting a butt wink in the, uh -oh. the squat. How am I doing? You're oh. so far so good. Let's go oh. a little deeper. Oh. A little deeper. Is that for real? Is that for real? That is for real. I just gotta get stuck. I'm right here. Okay. Okay, so generally if somebody, someone's losing their lower back and your hips are, are tucking under uh, before you reach parallel, we'll get you to put your heels up on something. Just basically you want to use this like as if it's a weightlifting oh, shoe. Gotcha. We're going to retest the squat. No butt wink. He's reaching depth fine. And if someone passes like. this part, <laughs> so if you fail the first part of the test and you pass the second part, that means that your main limiting factor is your ankles and you'd benefit from something like a weightlifting shoe. Now that's not to say that you should stop working on ankle mobility and just use a weightlifting shoe to band-aid the problem, but it is something that's gonna allow you to squat with proper technique right away, so it might be good to use a weightlifting shoe. If they also fail this part uh, of the test, then you know that the problem is coming more from the hips and not so much from the ankles. What if the knees, every time they go to come up, the knees start to cave in a little bit? The, the, here's two parts of that. The first part is there's not really a proof that it necessarily predisposes you to more injuries. So that, that's a concern of a lot, a lot of people, whether or not knee valgus increases the chance of injury. There's really no direct correlation that puts an increased knee valgus with an increased risk for injury. I mean, you see at the Olympic level all the time, people doing cleans with an excessive knee valgus with no knee pain and, and no injuries at all. Now, from an energy efficiency standpoint, you want to minimize those leaks as much as possible, and you want the joints, every single joint, to be as stable as possible so that you can transfer that, that force more efficiently from your muscles towards the ground and back up. Easy way to remember that, the way I've always thought about it, is any movement that happens in your body should translate into movement of the bar. So if you're getting lots of movement, but the barbell isn't moving, I mean, I can stay in the same spot and do this with my knees all day long, and the barbell's not going up, but I can't extend my knee without the barbell going up. Mm -hmm. So you always wanna do something that's translating directly into the movement of the bar. The other part is where in the movement is the knee valgus occurring? Now we know that at the bottom of the squat, your adductors actually play a huge role in the extension of the hip. So, so below 90 degrees of motion, your adductors are powerful hip extensors. So naturally they're gonna kick in at the bottom of a squat and you're gonna see that kind of like twitch of the knees. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, Right, if you see me coming up and my knees slightly come in and then as you come up, they go back to normal. That is natural and that is exactly what's supposed to happen. Your adductors gonna kick in below 90 degrees and they're gonna help you extend your hips. That's a good thing. Where it does matter is after 90 degrees of motion, 
especially in movement. Like if you see someone doing cutting or doing lateral lunges and you see that knee caving, that's exactly how you tear your ACL. So that rotation and change of direction, that's how you tear an ACL. You're not doing that in a squat, so it's not something that I would necessarily worry about. I'd also be maybe a little bit more worried about someone's lower back, more so than their knee. When the, when the knee caves in, it's actually a lot of times coming from the hip. You're like no longer really forcing your knees out any longer. And what I've seen over the years is I haven't really seen a knee injury from just that. Mm -hmm. What I usually see is somebody starts to round over. They like lost their back. Mm -hmm. They come out and shoot up out of the bottom of the squat. Their knee caves in. Now they're kind of doing this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And now yeah, they not, have a lot of loss of energy into the bar, right? Absolutely, yeah. Not enough pelvic stability. This is a, a, a really great simplified process that I, I learned actually from Jordan Shallow where you test before you have someone load a bar on their back, you test their mobility then the stability and then go strength. So that's kind of like the step-by-step -step process that he goes through, which I find awesome. Yeah, so we already tested mobility at the ankle. We tested mobility, obviously, at the hip when we saw them just do their squats. Now the stability, the way that I do it is I see how people move um, on one leg. So what I do is, can you do five lunges forward and then five lunges back? And you'd be surprised when you, when you see someone walking into the gym for the first time, they have a really hard time doing this movement. And here you can watch. I'm, I'm really paying attention to where their knees are going. Do they have enough ankle dorsiflexion to perform that? Yeah, do it this way, yeah. Ah, oh, no, yeah, turn around and do it. How, are they hips even or do they drop from side to side? Can they maintain balance? Some people start falling all over the place. Okay, good, so that looks really good. Now the next one that you're gonna do, you're gonna stand on one leg. This one's called a hip airplane, also classic Jordan Shallow. You're gonna drop straight forward, trying to keep your hips stacked and then you're gonna try to open, and then you're gonna try to close. So this is testing both mobility and stability. So you're testing here, your hip is in an internally rotated position, then you're externally rotating, then you're going back to internal rotation, and then you're going back in. This knee, bend it a little bit, always athletic stance, yep. And here too, I'm looking at the knee, do you have enough stability at the knee, do you have enough stability at the hip, do you have enough control to be able to externally rotate, internally rotate, and back up, do it three times. Pretty damn good for the first go. Good, one more. So now that we got that out of the way, remember we went through, uh, we checked to see if they have the mobility required at the ankles. We checked for the knees to see if they have the stability necessary to control the knee. And we checked the hip to see if they have both mobility and stability. So mobility, stability, and now we're gonna do strength, work on strength. You wanna <laughs> always put your hands in a position that's comfortable. So somewhere that's not cranking your elbows too much, it's not causing too much stress on the shoulders, that's gonna be individual for the person. Um, the only thing we wanna avoid is if people have uh, difficulty having their arms you know, just outside shoulder width and you see them over time getting wider and wider, that's uh, something that can lead to issues later on and Steph, you can talk more about that. What are you saying about the elbows? Just trying to make sure that you're not in a position where, where that's it's causing, aggravated? Yeah, that's causing stress and tension oh on the elbows or on the, the shoulders. So somewhere that's comfortable, uh, you want to squeeze your back together, and that's going to create a shelf on the rear delts here. That's where you want to place the bar. Uh, a lot of time, an easy way to get yourself into that position, uh, you'll see a lot of people do it where they kind of slide the bar past their delt, their rear delt, and then they'll bring it back over and it kind of pops where the bar is going to sit. And then when you pull yourself back under, it kind of slips right into that spot. Got it. And then that's that's a stable spot that uh, the the stable spot that kind of creates a shelf that's not gonna let the bar slip off when you're in the middle of the lift. Like I said, you should never try to force a movement upon a person. You wanna to try to work with their anatomy. Now, every person has a different orientation of their hips, uh, way that their hips are oriented. So in your hips, you have your acetabulum, which are two fossas that receive the heads of the femur. Some people have those acetabular fossas out wide. Some people have them right forward. Some people have them pointing down. Some people have them pointing up and everyone has a different one. So you want to make sure that the technique that you're using is playing uh, to your anatomy. So an easy passive test that you can do is, go ahead Steph, lie on your back right here. You can either have someone or you can do it really by yourself. You're going to bend your knee, just relax, and you're going to see what at what point do you have the most range of motion. So see how here you get pretty stuck. Some people even feel a pinching and sensation Steph, in the front of the hip. You can actually feel that as you're pushing her I can leg. Feel it, you can yeah. feel it, yeah. I can feel what, what's feel stopping tension. me. So now we're going to go a little bit wider, a little bit wider. Look at how much motion she has here, then she has here. It's pretty significant. Even out here, 
So now I think this range is is a good range. You can either put your your like here, here, here. You can see those like the toe work. like automatically just pointing outward too. Yep. Yeah, which Absolutely. is the same as how it was in her squat too. Right. That's what naturally felt good for her too, right? As soon as she walked out, her feet were a little bit wider and her toes were pointed out. Yep, absolutely. So this, there's a school, I think the most popular opinion on where your point should be, your toes should be pointing is pointing the toes out. But then again, that's also depending on your anatomy and your preference as well. Okay, now when you have the bar on your back and you're about to initiate the squat, I really, one cue that has really helped me a ton is to screw my feet into the ground and externally rotate my femurs so I can engage the muscles that are on the lateral side of my that hip. That cue was created by me, by the way. Really? Screw the, screw the floor? It helps so much because it really helps you, <laughs> it really helps you create more uh, stability around the hip. So now you have your, the lateral portion of the hip engaged. An extra thing that, I, that I've found very helpful is to learn how to engage the muscles that are in the front of the hip. So this drill, this is how I teach someone who might not understand the cue. Now, when you're going down into the hole, it's not just about slowing down the descent and making sure that you have control over the bar, but also to be able to summon all the muscles that are around the hip. Now, we use the Mark Bell cue of screwing your feet into the ground to get the lateral muscles of the hip. And now you're gonna also use the muscles that are in front of your, of your hip by thinking about driving your, your, your knees up and trying to bring your knees into your chest. Oh, I like that cue a lot, because I see a lot of people uh, drive their knees downward as they squat lower. Really? Well, because they keep continuing to drive their, drive their knees forward. Exactly. So their knees are like running away from them. Exactly. So that, that makes you, a lot of sense. You want to try to bring your knees upwards towards your chest. So now you're engaging the front, the side and back of your- Almost of like your... you're trying to pull yourself down with your hip flexors. Exactly, and the way that I teach it is, here, lay down on your back. So what you're gonna do, I'm going to hold your feet like this, okay? You're going to bend your knees and try to bring your knees towards your chest, okay? Go ahead. Yeah, as if you're squatting. Pull, pull, pull me forward, pull me forward, pull me forward. And now I'm going to keep pulling, but you're going to let me win, okay? Do it again. Good. Now let me win. Probably kind of hard, huh? <laughs> Good. So that's the movement. That's, that's how I usually teach people how to engage kind of the front of their hips. So you gotta be mindful, not only about, not only at what yeah. speed you're descending to, but you gotta be mindful of all the muscles that are around your hip, so you can summon them all and create more stability at the hip so your legs can create more power. Think of those uh, legs, you know, being like buried in sand, you know, like when you're on the beach. You think about how you would pull yourself down to the ground if your legs were kind of stuck and anchored into something. Now, another great reason why you wanna slow down the descent of the squat is because the analogy that I like to use is that of archery. You don't see an archer cock their, their arrow really fast and then let it go without control. You see them really think about where they're going and then hold it there and then go. In the squat, it's no different, especially when you have hundreds of pounds on your back, when you have a belt, when you have wraps or whatever that may be, you're in front of a crowd. You really need to be precise with your movement and know exactly where your hips are going. So slowing down the movement even a little bit, I'm not saying squat super slow, but squat at a, at a speed that allows you to change your movement as you go and allows you to control and know exactly where you're being positioned in space. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of the people that you see dealing with issues like getting dumped forward in the squat are people with super fast descents. They'll hit the, bottom, the hole and they're not necessarily aligned properly because they don't have that control. They hit the bottom and right away the first thing to go is their upper back. Remember, try to externally rotate your femurs and now uh -huh. you're gonna try to bring your, your knees towards your chest just like you did on the floor. And then you want your elbows to also stay in line with your torso. You don't want them to start flailing up because that might lead you to dump, dump the bar forward. Another thing that we see a lot or that's discussed a lot is whether or not people should be bouncing out of the hole of the squat. That's something that you see, you know, Olympic weightlifters are known for hitting the hole super hard, using the spring and the whip of the bar to get up. Um, you can rack stuff. <laughs> yeah, you can rack it. And a lot of power lifters do the opposite. They do take a slow and controlled approach uh, hit the uh, bottom a little softer and come up. Um, and I think the bow and arrow analogy works here as well, where you want to be able to go as quickly as you can with control. So you never want to free fall from the top, uh, but that last little bit, you can use a little bit to get the stretch reflex out of, uh, uh, out of the, your tendons, but you never want 
to just basically have your the full weight being supported by tendons and ligaments. Maybe uh, reverse the weight yourself, right? Like have the have the I ability like to stay in the yeah. proper position throughout the whole thing where you're not just blobbing down into the hole and trying to bounce out of it, right? Yeah, exactly. I it's saw that some, some with helping some CrossFitters years ago. And what I did to help remedy that was uh, some pause squats. Mm -hmm. I'd have them actually, but they weren't allowed to pause with their like hamstrings resting on their calves. I had them pause a little bit higher and it annihilated all of them. Even, even when I had them do a squat where they weren't breaking parallel almost on purpose, they had a hard time trying to control and reverse the weight because they're so used to kind of sure. what you're talking about, kind yeah. of dive bombing. Yeah. But what it did is in the long run, it made them stronger. It took a little while. But over over a period of time, it made them a lot stronger. Or it's common, especially in in bigger guys, that they keep squatting, they keep getting more and more restricted, especially on their shoulders. You know, they're benching more, they're gaining more muscle mass, and they're losing range of motion, mobility on their on their shoulders. And their their solution naturally is to keep widening their grip and widening their grip and widening their grip. Then they start running into other issues like elbow pain, bicep pain. Some people even have increased incidence of, of bicep tears. It's pretty, it's pretty common in powerlifting. And this injury is often painted as a result of overuse. But I think we I had a conversation with Jordan the other day, and we actually think it's the opposite. It's, it's a result of misuse. Now, anytime that you have decreased range of motion in one joint, you have increased range of motion at a different joint. So if you start lacking external rotation, if you start lacking uh, extension of the upper back. Now you start compensating for that lack of motion at this joint, you start compensating and using and using uh, other joints more. Now the role of the biceps is to obviously flex the arm but also to supinate the forearm. So now at the extent of the loss of range of, mo of motion at the shoulder with external rotation, you start getting that external rotation from the bicep, from the forearm and straining the bicep more and even the structures on the elbow here in the middle. So something that you wanna keep in mind as you get more and more into lifting, don't, uh, don't just neglect the fact that, you're, that you've, you're experiencing loss of range of motion in certain joints and ignore that and try to find other ways to move, but rather try to constantly be working on that so that you don't lose your range of motion in the first place and then expose yourself to other types of injuries like bicep tears and, and uh, elbow strains. How did all this hybrid stuff start? How did you guys get started with, I mean, you got a lot of people online interested in what you guys are doing, and I see the growth of everything. How did it, how did it kick off? Um, initially, it started with us training that way, training hybrid style, which initially included combining Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, and some functional bodybuilding or accessories. And people saw us training that way and got really interested. And we actually, before we started, so we created the software, and then we wanted, we needed 15 people to test it out. So we that was our goal. That was our goal, yeah, to 15 get 15 beta people, testers. beta testers, to, to test the software that we had created, um, which you invested almost all the money that you had in it initially. And when we posted it up on our Instagram, and, and at that time we didn't have stories, just on our Instagram, we got 400 replies, people that were interested in it. <laughs> And that was, that was a really good cue for us to realize that there was a, that definitely there was a need and there was an interest. Um, and then after that, I think I attribute most of the success and the growth of the business to uh, us genuinely caring about the people that we're, that we're helping and, and doing it for the right reasons. You know, just wanting to, like you, make the place a better place to lift and just disseminate good information, try to get more people in the gym, improve their self-esteem, their confidence, empower women, empower everyone. Uh, and also just de delivering way more than we're promising. Just trying to always provide more value than we're, than anyone else, and than than the money that you're that you're charging. So for us, it's we charge thirty dollars a month for pro for membership, and in that they get fifteen different programs. They get access to a private community on Facebook. They get access to six coaches, including Olympians. Fernando Reyes is part of our team now, a strongman coach that has gone to World Strongest Man. Us. Uh, Rachel leblanc who's a who's a national level Olympic weightlifter, international. So we, international level weightlifter. So we just have a really full team that's willing to help everyone out and just for $30 a month, I, I feel like that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, a lot of people aren't sure what to do, right? They, and then a lot of people want to be told what to do even. Sure. And a lot of people want to do a ton of different things. So we wanted to sort of be a, 
one-stop shop for all of that. You know, if someone wants to do gymnastics, we have a, someone who can help you with that. We have a gymnastics coach in a program. If you want to do strongman, we have that. You know, if you want to do Olympic weightlifting, we have that. So we, uh, we just wanted to be able to reach as many people as possible. And exactly, affordability and access. Yeah. That was what we basically Nutrition, said. mobility. Yep. Anything, yeah. anything fitness. Fitness, A to Z. Exactly. Fucking awesome. It's always awesome to have you guys here. Thank you guys so much. Um, just uh, what's your uh, YouTube? Pump it out to this YouTube and my YouTube, sign off for me. Yeah, my YouTube is fairly new, so guys, please come on, you know, help me out. <laughs> my YouTube is Steffi Cohen. Uh, my Instagram is at Steffi Cohen. You can find me at Hayden on uh, on Instagram or on Steffi's YouTube channel. Catch and hybrid, guys. all things hybrid. Yeah. You know, yeah. at Hybrid Performance Method, you can find everything from there. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you guys learned something from this tutorial and uh, take a few things and get stronger in the squat. And catch you guys next time.